Our Father and our God who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your great name, your faithful name. Faithful is our God. We thank you for the privilege of prayer mm -hmm. where we can come again in this gathering, dear Lord, online, where we can study your word. Mm -hmm. Thank you, oh God, for allowing us to be in our right minds at this time, dear Lord. We thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you for Brother Wade, who is going to lead out in your word, O oh God, so that we can understand and listen with your Holy Spirit leading him, dear God. Help us as we study, we may understand and internalize your word and study to show ourselves approved one to you, O God, for a workman need and not be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. Had O God be in our midst today, let the words he speak be of you, O God. Help us to be attentive. Help us, O God, to know that we are studying so that we will be well equipped for the end times, O God, so that we can testify about you, O God, and win souls for your soon coming kingdom. Continue to be with us today. Bless us and keep us. And when time should be no more, when thou shalt come, and burst the cloud and glory, save us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. 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 All right. So good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good, good afternoon. Evening. Good evening. Yes. Good evening. All right. So it's a pleasure to be here this uh, this evening. Oh, I uh, we had a two week break. I really apologize, but you know circumstances really uh, could be avoided. So I do apologize for the break. But I am really thankful to God that you know um, we could be here again this evening. And we want to continue from where we would have left off looking at who will replace the 12 physical tribes. And we would have talked about, you know, that we would have shared um, different verses in the Bible showing what the, the, the tribes really represent. And we saw that the lists were different, the original from in the Old Testament, and the list given in Revelation 7, 4 were different. And we looked at who would constitute the 12 tribes, who do they represent? And we stated that they represented God's people during this time here. So it is really a, risk, a, a list that reflects the character of the people more than the genealogy of the people. And I hope we got that. So we're looking more at character and not heritage. And we saw that the 10 tribes were scattered, so they do not exist. And God said so himself, and he did that purposefully. They do not exist. So there's no way we could find the 12 tribes today. There's no way. It's impossible. So we know that that list doesn't represent the physical tribes, but it represents spiritual Israel. We also saw that a, a Jew today who is of the heritage still has to become a spiritual Israelite if he wants to go to heaven. And let me clarify what I mean. Today there are Jews. And that Jew, if he wants to get to heaven, he has to have the faith of Abraham. And that faith of Abraham, we saw, is the acceptance of the gospel. We saw in Galatians that the gospel was first preached to Abraham. So he has to accept the gospel as it was preached to Abraham. And by faith, he would accept Jesus Christ. And we know mm -hmm. that from Acts 4.12 that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we may be saved. May be saved. Right, So he has to accept Jesus Christ. And so he's not going to get to heaven by his physical heritage, but by his spiritual heritage, the faith that he has in Jesus. All right, And so that is the only way that anybody will get to heaven today. 
Notice that when Jesus healed people, even when Jesus was on the earth, what did he say to them? Thy faith had made thee what? Whole. Whole, not well. Thy mm -hmm. faith had made thee whole. There's a difference between whole and well. So we're talking about your physical being and your spiritual being. That's wholeness. Mm -hmm. Well describes only a physical being. But Jesus said, your faith had made thee what? Whole. Whole. Mm -hmm. The man who came down through the roof, the first thing Jesus did was what? Thy sins be forgiven. forgiven. And then he said unto him, rise, take up your bed and walk. You see, what was more important was the forgiveness of his sin. That was more important than the healing. So, so the spiritual healing and the physical healing goes hand in hand. But what is more important is the spiritual healing. Mm -hmm. So that is why the spiritual aspect, the, the, the characteristics of a man or woman is more important than their physical characteristics or their physical heritage. And in this time here, uh, living in the end of time, if we must make it to heaven, then it depends on our character nothing else. And so we would have looked at that to, so that we should understand by now that the 12 tribes listed at, which make up the 144,000 is not physical Israel, but spiritual mm -hmm. Israel. And when we say spiritual Israel, those that have the faith of Abraham. All right, And we read that in, from the scripture in Galatians and other Bible passages. All right, we would have gone through that. So you you could look back at the videos and you should be able to get all the verses and the text you would have gone through verse by verse. And I hope that we could grasp that because now there is some type of focus on Israel and on the Middle East and the reclamation of the spot where the temple stood, which is now occupied by a mosque. And we know, brethren, that for Israel to reclaim that spot, they have to kill every Muslim in the, every Muslim around that area to get that because the Muslims are not going to surrender that spot so easily. So it's going to be an all-out war. And yet Christians believe that the temple will be rebuilt where there is standing now a mosque. How that will happen, I don't know. It may be that it could happen because we know that deception will take place. So it could happen and everybody might be now looking to that spot. But brethren, the Bible tells us that there is only one way to heaven, and that is not through the rebuilding of the temple. Right? So I, I hope that that portion we study helped us to address that particular issue. Now, when we left off, we had not totally finished looking at the list because there were two names missing, and we want to talk about that this evening. But before I do, anyone have any questions, you would, you would have watched the video and you would have gone over some of what we would have talked about, and you may have a question or a comment based on that. Um, so you can raise it at this time. Okay, well, if, if, if no question or comment, or you could always um, interject at any point in time, remember, on this platform here, we, we, we share, we ask, and we discuss, right? So feel free at any time, all right? So we want to look at the character of Ephraim and Dan. Now, remember, we're not talking here about physical characteristics because the list described is not based on heritage, but is based on, a, on, on character. It's spiritual Israel. So it is Israel by character. So the the the... Removal of Ephraim and Dan has to do with character and not necessarily some physical defect, but it has to do with character. Be and in the end of today's presentation, there's something very interesting that I think you all will enjoy. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I think it's very exciting. As Bible students, I think you should be thrilled about that. So stay tuned. Do not jump off at all. And we look at how the characteristics of each of the names on this list gives a description that is hard to, to push aside. All right, so let's go. So when we look at Hosea 4.17, it is very plain. It says, Ephraim is joined to Idas, let him alone. And that was the portion of Ephraim from a character 
character from his car looking at his character Ephraim is joined to his idols so Ephraim character is one of rebellion idolatry and he doesn't turn from it so so all that could be done for him is to just leave him alone with his idols all right what is sad though, what is sad though is that if we look at, I think it's Second Chronicles chapter 5, you would recall that the birthright was not given to Reuben. Anybody remember that? And I and I believe we would have spoken about that before. We would have mentioned that before. The birthright wasn't given to, to Reuben. Who was it given to? Manasseh or Ephraim? I can't remember who it was. Was it Manasseh? Judah. Ju it was, no, it wasn't given to Joseph. Judah. Joseph. It, Joseph, that's correct. That's First Chronicles. Uh, it's not Second, sorry. It's First Chronicles chapter 5. Right. First Chronicles chapter 5. Verse 1. The birthright was given to Judah. No, when Joseph went on to the scene, who was who? What would the blessing have gone to? His sons. His sons. Which one in particular? Manasseh. No, not Manasseh. Ephraim. Ephraim. Ephraim, Ephraim received the blessing, not Manasseh. Okay. When Jacob passed the boat right to Joseph, he blessed Ephraim and said, Manasseh, remember, Joseph was attempting to switch the hands. And Jacob said, not so, my son. I know what I am doing. And he put his right hand on Ephraim. So Ephraim crime is, is a very terrible one because Ephraim received the birthright that was passed on to Joseph. He received the blessing ahead of his brother Manasseh. And yet Ephraim turned from that and he turned to idolatry. You would find that sometimes Israel is even referred to as Ephraim in the Bible. So Ephraim is jointed idol, let him alone. And that is the characteristics that doesn't get included in the 12. Um, I see Brother Wade. Mm -hmm. Yes, sister. Who was the first? Um, Ephraim or Manasseh? Manasseh was the first born. Mm -hmm. okay. Manasseh was the first born. Ephraim was the second born son. Yeah. All right. So, so that that so that is the characteristics they attach to Ephraim, and that is why that is one of the reasons I do believe that Ephraim is not included because Ephraim turned to his idols and he didn't turn back. So Ephraim, Ephraim is not mentioned at all. We also have Dan is not mentioned. Now we'll go through a little more verses with Dan because the Bible didn't explicitly state what happened with Dan as it did with Ephraim. The Bible told us Ephraim is joined to idols, leave him alone. Now, Dan have similar characteristics to Ephraim, but we have to piece the, we have to put the pieces together to see Dan, who Dan is. Now, when we look at Genesis 49, 16 to 17, we notice that Dan, when Jacob was, was, speaking about his sons what he was actually doing he had looked at their character and based on their character he was making a pronouncement so for example when he started off with Reuben he said unstable as water you will never excel Reuben's problem was this if he with those who doing good he will do good if he with those who doing bad he'll do bad so that was he was unstable as water so so Jacob saw the character of his sons and he proclaimed what would happen to their posterity or the characteristics of their posterity based on the character of the father and so look at dan's character now dan has a dan seemingly starts off with a good attribute right dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of israel and if you remember one, there was a judge who was at day night. Who was that? Samson. Samson, that's correct. Samson was at day night. So he was of the tribe of Dan and he was a judge in Israel. If we also recall when the tribes were placed around the temple, where was Dan? 
Where was Dan around mm -hmm. the temple? East, west, north, or south? Where was Dan? You, we south, would have done that. We would have done that, brethren. I brethren think it's in north. Coco. That's correct, Sister Ennis. Dan was in the north. Not only that, Dan was the leading tribe in the north. And what was Dan's symbol? That was the eagle. Wow. Eagle. Dan symbol was the eagle. Remember that, brethren? It had four leading tribes around the sanctuary. We had Judah in the east. He was lion. We had Reuben in the south. was man. We had F Ephraim in the west. He was ox or, or, or calf. And we had Dan in the north, which was eagle. Right? So Dan was prominent. But then look, so we see here, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. So we see Dan prominent, even in the judges, Samson was a day night, right? But look at what Jacob says about Dan afterwards. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, and other in the path that biteth the horse heel so that his rider shall fall backwards. Now, that is a very strange pronouncement to make on Dan. After saying that Dan will be a judge as one of the tribes of Israel, it then, he then goes on to say, but Dan shall be a serpent, a snake, an adder in the path. Now, the ad, hear what the snake doing. It biting the horse heels from where? Where he biting the horse from? What? From the, yeah, but from in front or behind? The heel is behind. Fall backward. He, the, he biting from behind, so the rider will fall backward. Because if he sting the horse from in front and the front leg go down, the rider will fall forward, not so. But if he bite the horse from behind, the horse will throw the rider backward, right? Mm -hmm. So he biting the heel, so his rider shall fall backwards. Now, some equate this, you know, um, some equate this to be backbiting on the part of Dan. You know, Dan is an ambush. Is an ambush. There's an ambush personality we're looking at here. He doesn't come straight forward, but he biting. He didn't attack the rider, but he bite the horse heel to destroy the rider. So the rider will fall backward. So that is a very strange characteristic of Dan, meaning that it seems that Dan is going to turn away from what he was originally doing. And notice that after Jacob says this, hear what he says. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. So it's strange. So, so Jacob is, after he says, Dan will be a judge, he said, but then Dan shall be a serpent. And then he says, Lord, I waited for salvation. So the characteristics of Dan seems to change. Now, did, do we see that change in the tribe of Dan? Well, if we go to scripture, if we go to scripture, Hear what it says. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And this is Judges 18.1. In those days, the tribe of the Danites saw them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day, all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribe of Israel. So in the book of Judges, they're still looking for their inheritance. They're still conquering territory that they should occupy in Canaan, right? So Dan at this point in Judges 18.1 does not have an inheritance. Hear what it says. And the children of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back into his house. Now, I encourage you all to read the entire chapter of 18 so you'll understand the context. In the sake of time, we wouldn't be able to go into the whole story because it doesn't really add much to the study, right? The entire story kind of takes us away from our focus. So I encourage you all to read the entire story to understand. But the part that really focuses on Dan and where Dan ended up is what we are interested in. And this story brings that to light. Now, this is the day night, right? The churn up Dan. And they took the things which Micah had made. Now, Micah and the priests, they were not, they, they, they were into idolatry. So the children of Dan took the things of Micah and the priests, which was idols, right? So let's read. And they took the things which Micah had made and the priests which he had and came into Laish unto a people that were at quiet and secure. So in other words, they take the idols and all the artifacts of Micah and the priests 
and they came to people that wasn't warlike. They had no defenses. They had nothing to defend themselves because where they lived, it was peaceful. They didn't need to have any weapons of war. So Dan came to these people, people, and hear what it says. And they smote them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Zidon. And they had no business with any man. And it was in the valley that lied in Beth Rebob. And they built a city and dwelt therein. So Dan took the idols and artifacts of Micah and the priests, came unto a city where the people lived peacefully and quiet. They never had to fight war, so they had no kind of defense, no army or anything like that. And Dan fall on them and destroy them with sword and burn the city. And Dan took that now as their heritage. Now hear what it says. And they call the name of the city Dan, after the name of Dan their father, who was born unto Israel, which is Jacob, albeit the name of the city was Laish at first. So they renamed the city Dan. And yet, and the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. All right? You understand that, brethren? So uh, I, I, um, they went into idolatry. They went into idolatry. And the, and the Bible says that they're doing this while the house of God was in Shiloh. Hmm. <laughs> now, brethren, now think about this, right? Think about this. The Bible so connected. When Israel was broken up into two, who was king? Who became king of the ten tribes to the north? Was it Roboam or Jeroboam? Jeroboam. 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 I can't pronounce the name Yes, Jeroboam, right? Yeah. Now here the next question. Jeroboam set up two calves. Where he set them up? I know mm. one was in Dan. Oh, and one was in um, um, Bethel. Bethel. One was in Bethel. And where the other one was? Dan. In Dan. Um, in Dan. In Dan. In Dan, brethren. Set up the next one in Dan. Where do you think it was strange he was able to set up that next idol in Dan? No. Because well, Dan, 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 the tribe of Dan had already committed themselves to idolatry. So they had already committed themselves to idolatry. We see that in the book of Judges. So when they say, um, until the day of captivity of the land, is it the captivity of Israel? So Dan was always in apostasy until the But that's what the Bible is saying. That's yeah. what the Bible is saying. The Bible says that the tribe of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of captivity of the land. So the Samarian young point. That is what the Bible said. And they set up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. So when we see the characteristic of Dan, so it's not shocking that when Jeroboam was setting up his idols, he put one in Dan. Hmm. One was at Bethel, and we know what Bethel was. Bethel means the house of God. Beth, house, El, God. If you remember the origin of Bethel, it was where jo um, Jacob, yeah. Jacob yeah. had the vision. And he called it Bethel. Right? So we see here that Dan characteristics, just as Ephraim was idolatry, the character of Dan. And we see that the house was set up in Dan. The house of, of um, idolatry. And we saw that Jeroboam set up the golden calf in Dan. 
And you see, it's not that Dan didn't know the power of God. Because remember, if we turn back the pages in Judges, as I mentioned earlier, Samson was a Danite. And Manoah was a faithful man of the tribe of Dan. That was but, his but father. Yes, yeah, that was In Samson's life, that although Samson was faithful to God, he did some things as well that... Mm -hmm wasn't pleasing as well. Correct. Samson, well, we know the story of Samson, you know, as the Samaritan mentioned, and he didn't live totally devoted to God. It had a point in his life where he went astray, but thank God he was able to come back because in Hebrews 11, he's mentioned with the faithful. So he obtained forgiveness. So we see the characteristics of Ephraim and we see the characteristics of Dan. It's not that they just went into idolatry, you know, but they didn't let it go. And those are, and remember, we're talking about the characteristics. So spiritual Israel would not possess these characteristics. You get that, brethren? Spiritual Israel will not possess the characteristics of Ephraim and Dan. And in both cases, Ephraim and Dan didn't have an excuse because they were given prominent positions. They had, they, they, were, they were exalted, so to speak, by God in some of the roles and functions that was bestowed upon them and was given unto them. So they should have known better. They should have known better, but they are not recorded in the 12, which represents spiritual Israel. All right, brethren. So, so in looking at that, it would we I believe it should help us now to appreciate the lists given in Revelation chapter seven concerning the twelve tribes that make up the hundred and forty-four thousand. And I, before we move on, I want to make one point that I want us to keep in mind. John does not see the hundred and forty-four thousand as yet. The Bible tells us that he heard the number. Brethren, you, you, you recall that in Revelation 7 and verse 4. If you take your Bibles, turn there now. John heard the number. Didn't see them as yet. He heard the number 144,000 of those which are sealed of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And then he heard 12,000 from Judah and 12,000. So you heard the number. You didn't see them as yet. Keep that in mind as we go forward, brethren. All right? So any questions, brethren, as we move on to the next part, which is the great multitude? Any question on what we would have covered before? It is for Judge Israel. We all belong to the tribe. Sister Irma, you're saying something? Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, to say this. I, 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 I was trying to look through Genesis here. Um, when when um when Jacob told the wives, told all, all well, all that were there mm -hmm. to, to bring all the idols. And I I I, I to me I am I, um, wondering if I remember. That he buried it in Bethel. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't remember, but that is when Rachel was sitting on the idols. Yes. Yes. Um. I I am trying to find it. You will find that where where they when they they had to flee from Shechem. When they had to flee from Shechem, and when they had to flee from Shechem, he took the idols. And he buried it. So that would be somewhere between Genesis. Uh, yeah, let's see, Genesis. 30. But Sister Hannah. Sister Hannah. Hello? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead, Sister Hannah. I have I see you now next but, time. Yes. He didn't get all the idols because that one sat on some. Say she had a period and he did she didn't allow him to take them away. No, so she they didn't allow him to take them away. So they so that she she was like 
wanting them to keep them in as a part. So that's um yes a bit of idolatry there, love of idolatry. That was and, idolatry there. So, and I'm and wondering Mm -hmm. That was when they were fleeing from they were fleeing from Laban and she took her father idols and she sat on them and Laban couldn't get them back as he searched for them. He couldn't get them back. What I, what I wanted to, to find out if there was a significance in um in in with the having buried the idols in Bethel. Well, actually, the Bible says he buried them under the oak that was by Shechem. So that's Shechem. where it was Shechem. Shechem. So he had okay. told him, that is Genesis 35, right? And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up yeah, to Bethel. Well, there, Genesis and make 35. there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fled us from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make thee an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. Was Shechem part of Bethel? I don't think so. That was a different place to Bethel. Because they had to leave Shechem to go to Bethel. In verse 1, verse 35, God said unto Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make thee an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fled us from the face of Esau thy brother. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, Sister Mary, I'm seeing a the hand there. Yeah, I, I just, um, I'm not sure if it's a, uh true comparison but when you look at you know the lord started over 12 tribes and i'm looking at us today you know a mm. lot of us will start off on the junior seven day adventures but mm. would be come like ephraim and dan and, and get caught up in all different sorts yes. of unrighteousness and not be able to make it in the end and you know the mm. lord is not afraid to cut off Yes. Because you know his intention would have been the twelve, but two disobeyed, and he was not afraid to cut mm -hmm. them off. So you know, I I was just looking at it as a parallel to sometimes we believe just because we are seven day Adventists and we we are called by that name that there's some sort of guarantee, but the Lord is willing to cut us off if we are found unrighteous, like Ephraim and Dan. Mm -hmm. if we put another God before him oh, hey, so I'm just seeing that comparison that mm -hmm. you know we need to yes. check ourselves in that regard yeah then, a very yeah. important point very important mm -hmm. very, very important, important. Mm -hmm. very important you know and you know the strange thing is that when God called Jacob to come back to Bethel. The first thing Jacob told them is put away all the idols and the strange gods. Mm -hmm. So in going back to God, you have to put away all the idols and strange gods and you have to clean your garments. Mm -hmm. Now they did that physically, but also the spiritual aspect of it. And that is, we will see that those are the characteristics of the 144,000. They had no strange God and their garments were clean. All right. So, all right. So thanks for the comments. Um, any other comments before we move on? Because you want to move on to the great multitudes. So I don't know if anyone have any comments or questions. Um, yes, Brother Wade. Mm -hmm. um, good evening, everyone. Um, good I just want to add to what the, um, the sister just said. Many will be cut off. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just thinking about King Saul. Yes. Many are also gonna be in the faith, believing they mm -hmm. will be also doing the work, but mm -hmm. not knowing that they themselves have departed from God because of some little darling sin that they held on to and did not give up. Wow. That just came to my mind. Oh. Well, sister Kathy, thanks for that point too, also. 
because it 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 also lends to the, the point made by Sister Marianne, you know. That is a serious thing, Sister Kati, you know. That that's that sin we don't want to let go. Brethren, we have to wrestle and struggle to make sure that we we release from ourselves or God give us the power to release the things that really have us tied down. We don't want to be left with it like Ephraim and Dan. Mm. So thanks for that, Sister Kathy. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. All right, brethren. So, so this is a glimpse of the 144,000, and I hope we clear on it thus far. But we will, by the end of this session, we will reiterate and we will confirm what we would have learned on the 144,000, right? So that when we move forward, we, we have a clear understanding of them. So we want to look at the great multitude, the numberless group. Now, this has caused a lot of confusion, brethren. This has caused a lot of confusion, especially with the 144,000, because there's a school of thought that the 144,000 is a symbolic number. But the Bible told us that John heard the number. This group here have no number. But, you know, the school of thought says that the 144,000 is a symbolic number and the 144,000 and this group is the same. But we will look at, but, you know, we will look at that this evening and brethren, you come to your conclusion. But based on what the scripture says, we see in two distinct groups. One group have a number, one group doesn't have a number. So let's go. The great multitude. This is Revelation 7, 9 to 12. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. So, so brethren, let's look at the contrast. John heard the number of 144,000. If you have your Bible open, brethren, and you, you go to Revelation chapter 7, brethren, Revelation chapter 7, and verse 4, and it says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So the number is literal, brethren, but the, 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 the people or the children that are describing is symbolic, so that we know that it's not literal Israel, but spiritual Israel. But the number, brethren, is literal. It is 144,000. The Bible says that John heard the number. Now look at the contrast with the great multitude. John is saying, and after this, I beheld. What does that mean, brethren? So, so. What's that, Sister Hannah? He saw, so. He saw. So yes. it means that John heard the hundred and forty number, hundred and forty-four thousand. In other words, someone told him that the number that was sealed was hundred and forty-four thousand. But when we come to Revelation seven verse nine, John says, "And I beheld." So that means a John in vision is seeing a group, and he is describing the group as so big that he couldn't count the number, and he don't believe that any man could count that number. So this group John is seeing. The first group he heard, but this group he is seeing. And notice he says, after this, I beheld. So he so the, the hundred, the section with the 144,000 passed first. And he said, after I heard that number, which was 12,000 from Judah and 12,000 from um Reuben and 12,000 from Asher, after he heard that, he said, after that, I beheld, which means. After I heard about the 144,000, I am now seeing or looking upon a great multitude that no man could number. And here what he says, of all nations, nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues. So which means that he recognized that these are people from the earth. Not only that, he is seeing them in a particular place. Where is he seeing them, brethren, based on the text? Where is he seeing them? Before the throne. Before the throne. So that means they're not in earth. He's seeing them in heaven. 
So he's seeing them before the throne and before the lamb. How are they dressed, brethren? White robes. White robes. But look at this. And palms in their hands. This is significant. This is significant, right? And cried with a loud voice. So who crying here with a loud voice, brethren? <clears throat> The great multitude. And what do they say? Salvation to our God. So salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Now, brethren, we want to break down this, right? We want to understand this. So here's the question, brethren. White robes. Does John understand what white robes represent, brethren? When John sees this scene with white robes, do you think that John understands what a white robe represents or what white means in the context? They are in the throne room. You see them and they are clothed in white. Does John understand what that means? Yes. 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 They're saved. They are saved. Does John have that understanding? Even though... He is shown a vision. Does he have that understanding? Why Don't is it's supposed to represent purity. purity. I represent purity. Righteousness. Christ Righteousness. Christ. But not Christ. only that, he's he's watching them in the throne room and they're clothed in white. So it's supposed to tell John something, which I believe he does understand. So let's see. Let's go to Revelation 3, 4. Remember, John, would, we would have gone through the seven churches where the true and faithful witness was given John a message to write down, right? Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. hear what it says. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis. Remember this, Barry? We went through this. Which have mm -hmm. not what, brethren? Defiled. Yeah, so, because they did not defile their garments, what will happen to them? It's a white. What, what, will they, they will, what color will they be wearing, brethren? White. white. And why are they wearing that color? Because they are worthy. Because they are worthy. 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 So in other words, they did not defile their garments, which means that they, they had no sin. They, they, they lived a pure life. And Christ told him that they shall walk with me in white. And why they will walk with him in white? Because they are worthy to walk in white. John saw this, right? Now let's mm -hmm. look at John when he was walking with Jesus, when Jesus was upon the earth, right? Let's look at John 4, 35. Let's see if Jesus would have given his disciples an idea of what white represents. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the feast, for they are what, brethren? White. White to the harvest. And oh, already yeah, the harvest. Ah, so yeah. white here represents physical maturity, not so? White mm -hmm. represents physical maturity, because when you see the white, you know that the field right the harvest. But was Jesus really talking about the physical field they were watching? Mm -hmm. No. No, no. If, you, if you go back and read John chapter 4 and verse 35, you'll see the context in which Jesus was talking to his disciples because this word, these words here, they are the words of Christ. Mm -hmm. So white also meant, he was also referring to the people. He used, so he used the white showing that they were mature. In other words, they were ready for the harvest. They're ready for the harvest, but what happened? The laborers were few. Mm -hmm. Laborers were few. But white symbolized maturity. Physical maturity, spiritual maturity. So it just didn't only represent cleanse or purity from sin, but it represents spiritual maturity. And this is how Jesus would have spoken to his disciples. So John, walking with Jesus, would have would have would understood what he was saying. Because this is John here writing on what Jesus would have told them. Look in the book of John. When we look at, and 
This is John 20, 12. This is Mary when she went to the tomb of Jesus and she saw the angels there. What were the angels wearing? White. The angels were wearing white, right? We could not expect anything different from an angel. They were clothed in white. John is reporting that. So John understands white. He understands the meaning of white. So when John sees this great multitude, so the first thing he knows where they are from, he knows... They in, he knows that they overcame because they were in white. He knows that because they were in white. And he knows that they are pure. Come upstairs by 7.30, right? 7.30, you needed anything else? Right, he knows that they are pure, right? Brethren, you understanding that? Yeah. He understands white. So when he sees them clothed in white, he, he understands why they're in the throne room and he understands where they came from. So he knows who they are. Let's ask another question now. They have palms in their hand. Does John understand what palm branches represent? Let's go. Yeah. Let's see. John 12, 9 to 13, the book of John. Remember, this is John in, in the gospel that was authored by him. This is what he records. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that would come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So the palm branches was a form of salutation, a form of honor. Did John understand that, brethren? Yeah. Brethren, did, did John understand that, brethren? Yeah. He would have understood that. Because the same thing they did for Jesus, they had the palm branches. So it was a form of salutation, a form of honor to wave the palm branches and to show the palm branches. That is why today we have some people celebrating Palm Sunday and they will walk with the palm down the main road and that kind of stuff. We don't have to do that anymore. But that symbolizes the honor that was bestowed upon Jesus because there was, they were welcoming a king. Amen. So imagine, so brethren, so when John sees a great multitude dressed in white with palm branches in their hand, and what it is they cry with a loud voice, salvation to our God which sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb. So it's a salutation, brethren. It's a celebration. It's honor and glory they're given to God and the Lamb. So John understands this scene because every part of the scene describes to John what is going on and John understands it. So John sees a great multitude. He knows where they are from. They are from the earth because he said they are all nation, kindred, people, and tongues. So he knows where they are from. But when he looks, they are standing before the throne. So they're not on earth, they're in heaven. He also sees that they are clothed in white robes, which means that he understands they would have been redeemed. He also sees palm in their hands, so they are given a salutation. It is a celebration. It is it they they are exalting someone, and who are they exalting? The next verse tells us salvation to our God, which sit upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So John would have understood these things. So John is not ignorant as to who this great multitude is. The only thing John doesn't know is how many of them there are. He can't count them. He can't count them. So let's look on to verses. Let's look on to verses eleven and twelve, right? And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts. 
and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And this is our salutation, brethren. Amen. So it's a seven-point salutation. So, so when we look at this scene, when Jesus was guided into Jerusalem, think about the attitude of the people when they received him and they, 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 they said, the people said, Blessed Hosanna, blessed is the what, brethren? It's on the screen. Blessed is the what? That commented mm -hmm. the Lord. The king of Israel the Lord. Lord and the had the palm branches in the hand. Do you not see a similar thing happening where John is seeing that in the in the throne room where the people are there now and they have the palm branches and it's glory and honor to God and to the Lamb? Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, brethren, they could really worship and celebrate God and the Lamb. When Jesus came the first time, he came as a savior. So he really didn't come to set up a kingdom, but it was healing him as king. But now they could heal him as king. So we see a similarity between the scene that John would have described in the gospel that he authored. And the scene he is now watching in Revelation. He is seeing the people, they're in white, so they are pure, and they have the palm showing honor and salutation, worship, exaltation, and then by their words, salvation to God. It's almost like um, what it was a foreshadow of what was to come. Yes, by the people. Mm -hmm. By so the now they, by the palm branches, correct. So, so you see how the Bible had, and thanks to Samarian, you see, brethren, how we could look at parts, different parts of the Bible and put line upon line to help us get to understand of what is happening. So that scene that John described, where he was physically there, in vision, he's seen a similar scene. So that would lend to his understanding of what he is seeing. Now, I want to ask a couple of questions, brethren. And you will tell me, you will tell me, right? Yes, type meets anti-type, so true. Now, you will tell me, brethren. I want to ask a couple of questions, and you will tell me. Does John know where the great multitude came from? Yes. 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 Does, John, or does John know who they are? <laughs> Does John know who they are, brethren? Yes. Yes. Does John know what they would have done? Yes. Or accomplish? Yes. yes. How he could tell what, what they would have done or accomplished? How he could tell that? By the white robes. By the white robes. So he knows that they would have overcome. He knows that from the white robes. Does he understand why they are dear, brethren? Yes. 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 Yes, because when they opened them out, they said it's salvation to God and to the Lamb. Amen. Mm -hmm. So he understands. So in other words, this group John is watching, he knows who they are. He knows where they come from. He knows what they are about. He knows why they are there. The only thing John doesn't know is how much of them there are. He can't count them. But watch this, brethren. Watch this now. Watch this now. Now, this one, brethren, I want you to give me answer. What are your thoughts on this? We're going now to the next verse. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. Brethren, who John talking about mm -hmm. here? I'm 44. One of the elders, which is the um the we, we would have we would have yeah, talked yeah, about the elders. They are strong angels, right? We would have looked at that. Angels, so one of the strong angels. Yeah. John is now seen a group in white robes and 
The elders asked John, who is this group here in white robes and where they come from? But, but, and John say, hear what John say. So, but you know, I don't know, you know. Brethren, who is this group? They came out of great tribulation. The remnant, I don't know. Brethren, is this group the hun is this group the, the great multitude, brethren? Yes. No, oh. the hundred and forty four thousand. All right, thanks, Sister Wilson. Now, Sister Hannah, you say that this group he's saying here is the great multitude. But John know where they come from? Yeah. Oh, you know, oh. Those were those who lived till the end of the hundred and that came through the great tribulation. Ah, uh, brethren. So, brethren, you see how the you see how you have to investigate the real, how to really read the text? The elder asked John. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, down west. In other words, John, does, John is looking at a group which he doesn't recognize and he doesn't know. And he don't know where they came from. Because the great multitude, he knows where they came from. They are from all, every nation. Let's jump back. Let's jump back. Let's jump back here. And tongue and people. Tongues and people. Let's jump back to this. And lo, I beheld a great multitude, which no man cut number, of all nations and kindred and people and tongues, and stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm in their hands. So mm -hmm. John knows this group. He knows what is going on with them. He sees the celebration palm in their hands. He hears their voice. Uh, worshiping God, giving salutation and exaltation to God. He sees they are clothed in white, so he knows that they overcame. They are before the throne, so he sees them. So he knows certain things about them. He knows where they come from. He knows who they are. He knows what they are about. He knows why they are there. But the elder is now telling him, but what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? In other words, where they come from? Question: Why is he asking John? You see, because well, is if, when we when we continue to read Sister Hannah is a rhetorical question because John don't know, but he want to tell he John. Heard, he heard at a number one hundred and forty-four thousand. And, and this is the thing, brethren. This is it. The first time John doesn't see the hundred and forty-four thousand, he only hears them. So he yes. doesn't know, he doesn't see them by number. He, heard. he sees the great multitude, but now he sees another group which he doesn't know. So the elder highlighting a group and he asks him, John, but what about these here? Where they come from? And John said, well, you know. And what the elder said, these are they which came out of what? Great <laughs> tribulation. <laughs> And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Here the next part, brethren. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all their tears. Brethren, this is the first time that John sees the 144,000. We have heard before. How we know that, brethren? How we know that? Brethren have a lot of telltale insights given here and in previous verses. First of all, brethren, first point to consider. This whole chapter is like a, a pause. Remember, we were going down the road of the seals. And when we read the sixth seal, when we read the sixth seal, brethren, John asks the question in the sixth seal, who is able to stand? Remember, the last, the last part of the sixth seal was the great and terrible day of the Lord. So right now, we live in, in the sixth seal. 
So the sixth seal covers up to the coming of Christ. Or, or just before that period, I should say. Just before that. So the sixth seal is just up to that period. Because, right away, the seventh seal is the trumpet and Christ coming, that's so. all. Right, correct. This, we, will, this, this, we will come to that too. Correct, Sister Wilson. So the sixth seal takes us up to just before Christ comes, right? The sixth seal. And John asks, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And it is then John is now shown angels holding back the wind of strife, and the angels now going to hurt the earth. And John is, the angels are told, don't hurt the earth yet, because I have to seal a group before you start to hurt the earth. And John heard the number of them. So this group is sealed just before they're going to hurt the earth. And the number he heard was 144,000. So they will be the ones who come in through the great tribulation. And we know the great tribulation is when the seven last plagues fall in. So they will be the ones who will come through that period. That is why the Bible makes reference to they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. Because brethren, although they wouldn't be scorched by the sun, they would not be oblivious to the environment around them. So they're going to feel the heat, brethren. They wouldn't be scorched and destroyed, but they will feel the heat. Mm -hmm. They will thirst and they will hunger. Now God will provide, but he will not provide a lavish spread, brethren, where they will eat and feel satiated. They will, it will tap times when they hunger. That is why the spirit of prophecy says that if we cannot endure hunger, weariness, and delay, we will not make it. Mm. So, brethren, for the first time, John is seeing the 144,000. He only heard the number. So that is why the elder says, what are these? Because he's specifically not pointing to a, a group that is not the great multitude because John knows where they are, where they came from, and what they're doing there. In fact, he saw what they were doing. They were worshiping. But the elder turned and asked John, well, who are these here? And where they come from? And John said, well, you know. And then the elder turned to him and says, these are they which came out of great tribulation. Because we know that the 144,000 are those who will have to stand on the earth when the seven last plagues fall in. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Now I had a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy, brethren. And it just slipped me to put it in. So what I'll do... Next week, I will I will add it in for next week, please, the Lord. One God's be our light, I'm able to come on, and I will add it. But only the 144,000 will be able to go into the temple that is at Mount Zion. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Yeah. If you, if you look at Revelation 14 and verse 12, Revelation 14 and verse 12, you will see that... John says, I and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the on Mount Zion, and with him and a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So the hundred and there is so I will get that quotation next week, but they will be the ones to go in the temple. I do I I it's that to add that. brother. Mm -hmm. It's not fourteen twelve. You said fourteen twelve. Sorry, 14, 1, 14, 1, sorry, 14, 1. Revelation 14 and verse 1. Sorry about that. 14 and verse 1. Yeah. So, 
so brethren, when John sees them, so they are the ones who will serve God day and night in his temple. So, so the, the great multitude and the 144,000, they are two distinct groups. It is not one group. They are two distinct groups. And they, they, they have, they have a, spe a specific purpose to serve. The 144,000 have a specific purpose. They have to stand pure for God under the worst conditions ever on the face of the earth. And they will have to stand against Satan with his unlimited and unbridled wrath. And they will demonstrate before the whole universe that a man who, or woman who has given over his heart wholly to God could live without sin. Amen. That will be demonstrated on the earth. Brethren, and when they would have demonstrated that, brethren, they would have vindicated the name of the Lord. And what that, the, what that will show, brethren, is that there was no need for sin. There was no reason that sin should exist because a man don't have to sin or woman don't have to sin. Sin is a choice. And Satan, brethren, will have no argument. He will be allowed to do his worst. And it will not prevail against those in whom Christ dwells. Brethren, when you read verse 13, you shall hunger no more, neither shall they thirst anymore, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Brethren, they have to end your great tribulation, brethren. The, the great tribulation, brethren. The Bible said they will come out of great tribulation. That is why when we read the description of the 144,000, brethren, they look horrible. But they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Um, by the way, you remember I told you, like the song say, um, they'll be weary and mm -hmm. end uh, um, triumphantly. They would rise, but they would um, weary and worn, tired. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. yeah, yeah. So let's look at the identifier now. Sorry, go ahead. Somebody had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I thought someone had a question. Sorry. Right, so identifying marks. One, they exist in the last days, end of time. We see that from Revelation 6, 15 and 7, 4. John asks who is able to stand. Revelation chapter 7 answers that question, right? Another identifying mark. They belong to spiritual Israel. They are true Christians. We went through Revelation 7, 5 to 8. And we went through that at length. So they are not physical Israel. That is impossible at this point in time in Earth's history. That is to recover the 12 tribes is impossible. So we're talking about spiritual Israel. We're talking about people, those with a certain or particular character. All right? Each of them is... Each of them is sealed with the seal of the living God, which involves the observance of the true Sabbath. They are, they are sealed. They have the name of God in their foreheads. All right? And they will stand true to his day of worship. They attain to perfection of character. And we have that in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 5. We have verse 1 and verse 5. Verse 1 says... Revelation 14.1 says that they have their father's name written in their foreheads. And Revelation 14.5 says, In their mouth was found no guile, and they are without fault before the throne of God. So perfection of character. 
Revelation 14, for they are virgins on the fire. Now, brethren, this is not to be physically a virgin because marriage is acceptable before the Lord. Marriage is not an abomination, brethren, and marriage does not defile somebody. But what they are talking about in the time of apostasy, and we know that a, a, a church is normally regarded as a woman, and in this period where the 144,000 will emerge, there is an apostate church, which is referred to in Revelation as the harlot. The 144,000 have not defiled themselves with this woman. So they are virgins. In other words, they didn't drink the wine of Babylon. We understand, brethren? Yeah. Brethren, we understand? Yes. Right? Yeah. So, so this is spiritual. It's not a physical thing, but spiritual. All right. So these are the characteristics of the 144,000. They overcome the beast and his image. Revelation 15, 2. They are the ones who have to stand against the beast and his image. Remember, hmm. probation is closed on the entire world. So the dragon and his agencies, all of them are coming. The whole world at that point who... It will be turned over to the beast and his image. They will be worshipping the beast and his image, and they come in at the 144,000. So they overcome the beast and his image, and they stand. They sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. The song of Moses is a song of deliverance. And we remember when they came through the Red Sea experience, that they sang of the deliverance when they saw the oppression of Egypt, and Egypt represents Babylon. So they sang the song of deliverance. So the song of Moses represents deliverance from Babylon and of the Lamb. That is the sacrifice that Christ made for them. We see that in 14.3, they sing a new song. They are the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, which is Revelation 14.4. Now, first fruits... When we say first fruits, they will not be the first ones to go to heaven without seeing death. Did somebody uh, did that happen to somebody before? Enoch. Yes. And who else? Um Elijah. 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 Elijah, right? So so they wouldn't be the first person on the earth to be translated without seeing death, but they are first fruits in a particular context. What they have gone through, nobody else has gone through, and they have stood the test. And so they are first fruits in that regard. And we see here that none of them experience death. They are the living righteous who will be translated. Revelation 44, they are redeemed among men. If we go, I believe, to Hosea 14.4, there are those who will be redeemed from the grave. Let me see if I find that quick to give you that verse. So it's Hosea. Hosea chapter. Hosea 14. No, Hosea 14. Okay. Hosea 13, 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy place. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. So there are those who will be redeemed from the grave and from death. But these will be redeemed among men. In other words, they live in. So they will be redeemed from among men. They will be alive. So these are 10 characteristics of the 144,000. So any questions or comment on the characteristics? All right, brethren. So this is the characteristic. So brethren, what we see here is... is an answer. So when in, in the, the sixth seal, who are able to stand? The answer is given to judge. It have, a, it have a group that will stand when the wrath of God is poured out on the world. And that is the 144,000. Now, brethren, I did promise you something very interesting, which I think you should enjoy as Bible students. I enjoyed it. This was really thrilling to me, brethren. 
I want to show you something that really, really, uh, brethren, I don't know how to say it. You will, you will share with me your experience when you see this, right? Now, Brian, let's go to an exercise. Grab your Bibles and let's go to Genesis. Genesis, right? And we go into Genesis and it's 29. Genesis 29. Mm -hmm. Right? Genesis 29. And we starting from verse 32, right? So here what we're doing first. We want to look at now all the names, right? This is the name of the 12 tribes mentioned in Revelation 7, 4, which would represent spiritual Israel. We're going to look at the meaning of all the names and the order in which they were given. Brethren, I find this to be very interesting. So we want to see the names from in the Bible so that you all know that I'm not making up this in order to craft it into whatever I want to do better. You're going to see the name, you want to see the meaning. And then we will see something, brethren, that I find is incredible. Watch this, brethren. So Judah. So let's see what Judah named me. So in from Genesis. 29, starting up from verse 32, it shows how all Jacob's sons came into existence. So we're looking at Judah. Let's go to Genesis 29, 35. Are we there, brethren? We there? Yeah. Hear yeah. what it says. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, No, I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. So what Judah means, brethren? Praise. Praise. Let's go to Genesis 29 and verse 32. For Reuben, and Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for he said, Surely the Lord had looked upon mine affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. So Reuben means behold a son, because Leah said, and, and Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. Excuse me. And Reuben means see a son, behold a son. Sister Hannah. Yes, Sister Hannah. Can you just give the text again for which one? Reuben. You said the Ruben. first one was, was Genesis 29, 39, 35, 35, right? 35. And this one is Genesis 29, 32. Okay, so 32 is the second one. Okay. Yes. Now we're going to God. Now the reason why we're not following the natural order of the sons is because remember in Revelation they put them in a different order. So we're going, we're looking at the we looking at the meaning in that order, right? So we're going now to God. God is the third one mentioned in Revelation 7. And we go into Revelation, sorry, we go into Genesis 29, 11. Genesis 29, 11. Hear what it says. And Leah said, a troop cometh, and she called his name God. Now, for those who have the center column, the word used for troop means company. The but word, but word is it yes, 29, sir. 11? That is Genesis 29 and verse 11. Sorry, Genesis 30 and verse 11. Sorry, sorry. Uh -huh. Genesis 30 and verse 11. Genesis, so, so God is Genesis 30 and verse 11. And Leah said, a troop cometh, and she called his name God. A troop cometh. In other words, a company to a company of sons. So when she had God, she envisioned that she's going to make more sons. She said that two cometh, and she called his name God. A company of sons, right? Asher, that's the next one on the list. This is Genesis 30 and verse 13. Genesis 30 and verse 13. We get that we there, brethren. Genesis 30 and verse 13. We seeing it? Yes. And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. 
Asha is blessed and happy. Or oh, happiness. That is Asha. Right. We're going to jump now to Naphtali. Right. We're going to jump now to Naphtali. Let's go. This is Genesis 30 and verse 8. Brethren, Genesis 30 and verse 8. So we see any meanings, right? Genesis 30 and verse 8. And Rachel said, With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali. So Naphtali is my struggle, my strife, my wrestling. Naphtali. No. To get the meaning of Manasseh, we have to go to when Joseph had his first son, because Manasseh is the grandson of Jacob, not his son. So we're going to jump to Genesis 41, verse 51. Genesis 41, verse 51. Genesis 41, verse 51. And I read, brethren, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he had made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. So I'll read that again. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he had made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. So Manasseh means God has made me to forget. So that's Manasseh. Let's go now to Simeon. Simeon is Genesis 29 and verse 33. Genesis 29 and verse 33. We dear brethren? Yeah. All right. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord had heard that I was hated, he had therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Simeon means to hear, because the Lord heard her, her of her that she was hated. The Bible says the Lord had heard that I was hated. And she called him Simeon. And Simeon means to hear or hearing. That's what Simeon means. Let's go to verse 34, which is Levi or Levi. Hear what it says. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, No, this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. So Levi or Levi means joined. That is Genesis 29.34. That is Genesis 29.34. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to Issachar. This is Genesis 30 and verse 18. Genesis 30 and verse 18. Issachar. And Leah said, God had given me my hire because I have given my maiden to my husband. And she called his name Issachar. So, so what happened was that Reuben went out in the field and he, so Issachar means servant, his servant. Reuben went out in the field and he caught mandrakes and, and Rachel wanted the mandrakes. So Leah tell Rachel, well, if you want my mandrakes, I will go into Jacob tonight. So in other words, she pay to go into Jacob with the mandrakes. So that is why Leah said, God had given me my hire because I have given my maiden to my husband and she called his name Issachar. 
So he well, means. Versus that again? Um, huh? Versus that again is Genesis 13, what, 13? Genesis 13, 18. Genesis 30, 3, 0. Genesis 3, 0, 18. 18. Genesis 30, 18. So Issachar means to hire or servant. Zebulon. Genesis 30 and verse 20. Zebulon, Genesis 30 and verse 20. And Leah, so, and Leah said, God had endured me with a good dory. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons and she called his name Zebulon. So Leah said, well, now Jacob will come and dwell with me or live with me because I make him six sons. And she called his name Zebulon, which means dwelling. And the last, and the next son we will see is Joseph, which is Genesis 30 and verse 24. Genesis 30 and verse 24. Genesis 30, 24. This is Joseph. And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. So Joseph means God shall add, or the Lord shall add. Joseph. Or adding, or simply adding, Joseph. So to go from to go to for Benjamin, we have to go where Rachel was making. Where Rachel, right? So right. So we need to go when jo Jacob had to leave Shechem, and Rachel made. Um, Rachel made Benjamin along the way, all right, and he had to run and she died. So let's go. And she said to call him Ben Oni, but instead they call him Benjamin. Ben Oni means son of my sorrow, but Ben Oni means son of my right hand. All right, let me just find that because I had it here, no? Let's let me, where I had it. Right. So that is Genesis 35 and verse 18. Genesis 35 and verse 18. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, and she called his name Benoni. Which means that is the son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, the son of the right hand. So Benjamin means son of my right hand. And that is found in Genesis 35 and verse 18. So brethren, we see where we got. This is the names, their meaning straight from the Bible and the order in which they are given in Revelation. Now, brethren, check this out, right? Let's line them up. Now, brethren, I, I make a mistake here, right? I was supposed to put the two... I, I have two phrases for us to read. I was supposed to put them on two different slides because I didn't want you to see the second one, right? But I make that mistake already, brethren. I can't correct it now. So here, what I, block your eyes from the bottom. Don't read the bottom as yet, brethren. Read the top alone, right? I don't know if Oli can do that, but try very hard, brethren. So let's go. So if, if, if we put all of them together, right? Look at the top. Don't look at the bottom yet. Look at the top. Don't look at the bottom. Look at the top alone, brethren. Discipline yourselves, brethren. Look at the top. Look at what it says. Praise, behold our son, a company of sons. Bless and happy. My struggle, my strife, my wrestling. God has made me to forget. The Lord had heard, joined his that's servant. All the names. Yes, that's all the names. Dwell. So let's let me start over. Praise is Judah. Behold our son Reuben. Company of sons, God. Bless and happy is Asha. My struggle and my my struggle and my um my strife. That is Naphtali. Yeah. God has made me to forget Manasseh. The Lord had heard or hearing is Simeon, his servant, that is um, 
jo sorry, we have joined. We have joined as Levi. His servant Issachar, dwell is Jebulon, and God shall add Joseph, son of my right hand, is Benjamin. Now let's make it into a sentence, Ben. Read it. Praise God, a son, a company of sons, blessed and happy. After struggling and wrestling, God has caused to forget the hardship. The Lord has heard and had joined his servants, dwelling with them, adding joys and blessings to his sons of his right hand, the 144,000. Wow, wow, wow. Lovely, lovely. <laughs> Well, Brethren, you see that, brethren? Yeah, they Redren, are. Brethren, describe any 144,000. Yeah. Wow. Brethren, this blow me away. You know, it brethren, the names in the particular order in which they given, if you put on what they mean, brethren, that is what it's saying. Oh. I tell you how to The son of company of sons. Less than happy. Praise God, a son, a company of sons. Less than Praise God, a son, a company of sons, blessed and happy after struggling and wrestling. God has caused to forget the hardship. The Lord has heard and had joined to his servants, dwelling with them, adding joys and blessing to his sons of his right hand. The 144,000 brethren. That is, the, that is the meanings of the 12, the, the, name, the meaning of the names of the 12 listed brethren. In the order that they are listed in, in Revelation chapter 7. Brethren, you think that was by coincidence? Oh, wait. Hmm. Brethren, this is the experience of the 144,000. Brother, where this is truly amazing. And yep. it really shows that you have to search out the scriptures. It's like hidden gems now. You yes, know? it's hidden gems. And searching it, you're able to unearth the treasures. This is mm -hmm. like a treasure. Brethren, when I was researching and I came across this, Brethren, this just blew me away. So I, I went back and I look at the names myself, and I went through each name to make sure, brethren. And and when and this evening here, we went through each name from the scriptures. When we went through, we didn't make up the, the meanings to suit what we want to say, brethren. And when you look at it, brethren, you see the experience of the 144 dollars. So, so brethren, brethren, it, it, it show you that what is more important, and brethren, this this to me concrete, it, it, it concretes the fact that more than the heritage is the character, because this is the meanings of the names that make up the twelve. This is the meanings, brethren, and and remember, name represents what brethren character. So what was most important than the blood was the character of the individual brethren, the character which was suggested by the name. So that this list, brethren, is not based on our heritage, you know, it's based on the characteristics. And this is the characteristics of those who will stand in the last days. This is the characteristics, brethren. I I, this just this, when I discovered this, Baron, this just blew me away. Now, Baron, I didn't come up with this. I don't want to make it look like I am the originator. But when my research, I came across it, and I and I I went to make sure it was so. so I I went and I look up every name from the Bible, and I look up every meaning from the Bible, and it it proved to be true. And I, and that is what we went through before I showed you all this. We went through each verse where each name was given. And we saw the meanings of the names in the verses. And when you put them all together, it makes sense, brethren. This is what you end up with. So, so the statement on top just have the raw meanings, and the statement below is when you make it into a sentence. When you when you structure them into something that is legible, brethren, 
So it's so at the end is character, but not heritage. Character. It's who you are in your heart. So, Brethren, that brings us to the end this evening. Um, when we come back next time, Brethren, you have a chance to go over the, the video and you review it. When we come back, Brethren, you can ask questions or comments. And we will start back on track now with the seventh seal, which is because this brings us to the end of Revelation chapter 7. So, we're going to jump back now. So Revelation chapter 8, will, which will conclude, it will start with the conclusion of the seals, and then it goes on to the trumpets. All right? So any questions or comments at this time, brethren, feel free to ask anything or to share. And as always, if not, I will turn you over to Sister Ines. And when we come back again, we'll do a little review, and then we'll go on to the seventh seal, which resumes in Revelation chapter 8. Brother Wade. Yes, Sister Wilson. His name was Benoni, right? And who called him Benjamin? Um, his, his father. father. His father, and yes. The Benoni. mother had named him Benoni, which means son of my sorrows, because she was dying when she made him. Yeah. And the father said, No, I will son call him life Benjamin. Life. So it's Benoni and Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Oh my, all right, yeah. All yeah, right. Benjamin. I'm Brother Wade. Yes, it says, Scott. Uh, son of my right hand, you know, when Jesus sat at his father's right hand, it was favor. I mean, know yes. that um, his father loved his mother. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, Correct. son of my right hand, meaning, you know, he, he loved his mother dearly. Yes, yes. Okay. Correct. No, that's a valuable point, it says, Scott, because he loved Rachel very much. Yes. Rachel was his right hand. That was his favor. Yeah. Son of his right hand. So as you, yeah. as you mentioned, Sister Iska, I like the thought, you know, Christ is on the right hand of the Father. The sons of his right hand. And by the, by the way, he <laughs> lost Joseph for so long. All he had was Benjamin. Yes, all he had was Benjamin. They yes. didn't want to give him up when they found Joseph because that was what he, his last baby he had home. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to release him at all because that was the last son he, he had for Rachel. Right. And he, he was afraid he would have lost Benjamin. He didn't want to send him. He was he was precious to him. Um, brother Wayne. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm looking in my little book here and I really didn't know this. Benjamin was also born in Bethlehem. The birthplace okay. of the Jesus and David was born. Okay, okay. Okay, and, I, I didn't know that. Um, this is I didn't he know too that. was a type of Christ, born in the world, a man of sorrow, but mm -hmm. elevated to the right hand of the throne. That's oh. the way how um how dog how dog bachelor puts it. Okay, okay, okay. I didn't know that Benjamin was born in Bethlehem. I, I didn't know that either. So, well, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing that. I learned something. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. And, and it, you know, he was originally named Son of My Sorrow, Benoni. But his name was changed to Benjamin, Son of the Right. Benjamin or Benjamin? Well, Benjamin. Well, that's how they pronounce it. But we say Benjamin. But you know, okay. the Hebrews say Benjamin. Okay. Yeah, but we can we say Benjamin. Nothing wrong. Just our accents. Yeah. All right. So, brethren, if no further questions or comments, I'll turn you all over to Sister Ines. Uh, Sister Ines got one more. No, brother, we am right here. Okay. Right, right, good. 
Okay. So thanks for. I particularly like that how you put together the meanings of the different names. Well, Sister Ennis, that that I I found this in research. So I am not the originator of this. I oh, found okay. that in research. But what I but I I what I did do just to make sure it was legitimate. I went through all the names to make sure mm -hmm. that it it like it it meant what it says, and that's what we did here tonight. You know, so I mm -hmm. found when I found it, it blew me away. So I say I will share it with you all because it is it it does line up with the scripture, and that's why I gave the scriptures where each name was found and what it means. Okay. So I found it it lined up with scripture. But I, 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 research. I was blown by it and I, I, yes. I, I, I it, it really concretized certain things in my mind and I hope it did the same for you all. Yes. So I hope that each of you were blessed as I was blessed by the Amen. study this evening. Yes. And Sister Hannah, I want to ask you to pray to close us off, please. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy and your goodness towards us, children of men. We thank you for this precious time that we can spend in these last days to dig deep into your word as we delve to this whole plan of salvation and how you have brought through your people and how you are bringing us through until we see you burst the pulse of heaven, Lord. We look forward to that day. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us of our sins there, Lord. Teach us daily to come to you and have our sins go before, to repent as you convict us of sin so that we could be numbered among those that will be found in your kingdom when you come. With a blessing on each one on this line, all our families and those who are not present, all who will actually hear this word, Lord, let it sweep in their heart to dig deep and study about you and come to know you. The such special blessing on Brother Wade, Elder Wade, as he digs deep and leads us in this study. Continue to bless all our this technology that we're using so that we can share it to others as we get it. And tonight, Lord, if it's your will, take us safely into a night of rest and bring us back another day like when you would bless us with more studying of the word. That, so when you come, we'll be ready to meet you in the clouds of heaven. I pray in the name of Jesus and thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Amen. Hannah. Amen. Amen. Good night. Thank you. Amen. Really wonderful.